Next on the agenda here is uh, uh, Martin Meacock, uh, Descartes Director for Product uh, Management for Customs, Compliance and Global Trade Content in, uh, in Europe. Um, Martin uh, uh, has been working for, for years now. He brings years of experience in international trade and customs and regulatory compliance. He's worked on both sides of the fence, or I, would I should say on the three sides of the fence. So 10 years with UK Customs before joining an international trade consultancy, and now he's on the uh, uh, software side. So um, uh, welcome, uh, welcome, uh, Martin. Mar Martin will will be uh, um, uh, giving us an update on how Brexit, e-commerce, UCC, and local customs authorities continue to challenge. Um, uh, you know the the the, uh, the way uh, customs are being operated. Uh, so, uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you for that uh, uh, nice introduction. Uh, I, I promise I'm not as old as that history makes me sound. Um, uh, and uh, I, you'd be glad to know when I left customs, I, I got my life back, sort of. Um, okay, so a rather nice picture of me there. So you can just. Put a, a face to the uh, the voice. Um, as, as Paul said, I'm, I'm going to talk today um, about a number of challenges. Uh, as businesses, we all, we all have challenges, but sometimes we forget that the customs authorities have some challenges as well. Um, they often find themselves, like we do, uh, not often subjects of their own making, but uh, have to deal with changes in the market. Um, such as e-commerce, which is affecting all of us, um, but also political decisions that are placed upon them, that they are effectively given a problem to uh, try and solve. So there's two of those currently. Uh, Brexit, obviously a, a big issue for everybody, um, and the ongoing uh, issues surrounding the Union Customs Code. So first of all, I'm going to start with uh, Brexit. Obviously, that's uh, high on everybody's agenda. Um, just recently, uh, there's been some more parliamentary committees, and it's always a risk in doing some of these webinars and trying to prepare for them, because you're always worried there's going to be a, a sudden announcement that, that just throw your, your slides uh, completely out. Fortunately, the UK government is uh, in such disarray, they, they, they postponed uh, the announcement today. So. Hopefully, what I say today is, is, is safe for the next 24 hours, uh, 48 hours anyway. The challenge for customs is, is very much like for businesses. They, they're not quite sure uh, what procedures, resources, facilities they're going to need, uh, very much dependent on the, on the outcomes of the negotiations and what kind of, uh, ex, what does exit look like. At airports and deep sea locations, um, the procedures, the facilities are, are pretty much there already. They already have to deal with third country traffic. Um, EU traffic normally goes through the port systems in the, in the same way. The real challenge for everybody is going to be at those short sea roll on, roll off locations and obviously the, uh, the land border uh, in between the, the island and uh, Northern Ireland. Interesting in, in one of those committee meetings that uh, it was uh, earlier this week uh, where the Port of Calais and the Port of uh, Zeebrugge were, were, were talking. Um, again, Zeebrugge is, uh, is, is interesting. They already have a, 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 an amount of third country traffic um, and so they're looking to extend the digitalization of their ports and terminals uh, that are already dealing with third country traffic. So looking to extend that to their, their EU terminals. Um, their challenge is, is land. Yeah, they are looking at creating parking lots uh, for inspections. Um, and it's, it's probably interesting. It was an interesting figure given by the Port of Calais at French Customs. We're estimating that the number of checks was probably going to be around 1%, which is about normal. We see a similar sort of figure in the UK. But that's 1% overall trade. If you're importing goods subject to phytosanitary or health controls, agriculture, meat, dairy, uh, flowers, a lot of traffic of flowers obviously from uh, from the continent, then the percentage of check is probably going to be a lot higher than the 1%. And, and when they're checked, they need somewhere to inspect those goods. And it's not just the, the lorry necessarily parking up, the lorry has to be unloaded um, and, and inspected. Uh, in Calais, they were talking about uh, they're already building a new port area um, and uh, some, some land nearby that they might be able to use. But uh, I think the figure they were giving was, you know, at least 20 million euros it would cost them to, to build these facilities. 
So here's a here's a nice graphic. You can see the kind of uh, volume of, of road movements going through the the, the UK ports. Um, you know, there's 4.6 million vehicles going both way. This is this is a, the figure coming coming in and out through the Straits of Dover. Um, the value given for that kind of traffic through the, the short strait, so just between uh, the Channel Tunnel and Dover and Calais, was 20, uh, 240 billion. Uh, now, that's, that's a huge amount of, of figure, and, and if we start looking at the you know, tariffs on that, um, then that becomes quite a, a scary, scary figure as well. So, from a from a declaration point of view, it's already been estimated that uh, the current 55 million customs declarations could go up to over 200 million. Um, obviously, the UK is, is investing in a new customs system, uh, which they, they hope we will be able to cater for that, that increase. But there will be similar increases on the continent. So the, the, the Dutch system, the Belgian system, the French system will also potentially have to deal with those increase of declarations. And we already see in some of those member states, uh, they can suffer at times when uh, a lot of declarations are being processed. So I think that the Dutch customs were talking about an increase uh, of 730,000 import declarations. Um, but on export, just to show you the flow of traffic, was uh, almost uh, over 4 million ex extra export declarations. Now to handle that, they've, they've already committed to employing uh, some 750 to 900 extra custom staff. Um, Belgian customs... You know, still looking uh, at, at, at their resourcing needs, but again, we'll see an increase of declarations. Um, you know, imports by sort of 14, 15 percent, exports by about 50 percent. The challenge for for most customs authorities is when do they start recruiting? Again, it's like businesses. You know, when when does everybody start thinking we need extra staff to handle this? Um, with no clear outcome, uh, it's very difficult for them to start start doing that. Only, only as I'm aware, Dutch Customs have, have made any real start on, on doing that. The real challenge will be for engaging with businesses that, that don't do customs at all now. So, uh, you know, UK had a figure of sort of 130,000 uh, companies that were VAT registered, um, but only deal with the EU. That's probably an underestimate of the total, because that's only VAT registered businesses. Um, there's, a, there's likely to be a lot of low uh, small traders that are not that registered doing quite a lot of, of cross-border traffic through uh, through dover and you know it's going to be similar numbers across across the continent of europe uh, that that just don't do any non-eu traffic so the whole world of customs declarations is, is going to be new to them so if we look at that future trade and arrangement um this is just a, a cycle if you can see there uh so if we start from the European side, you know, there has to be a, an export declaration. Uh, there's a notification of arrival at customs. Uh, there's normally a notification of export. Then you're, on, you're across the border. You need some kind of pre-arrival security declaration. You have to tell customs they've arrived. The border agency, uh, UK Border Force in the UK in this case, will, will, might want to expect the goods. They go into some temporary storage, might have to be inspected for phytosanitary, for the health goods. Um, and then there's an import declaration, uh, which may be held, inspected, um, or, and then ultimately cleared. Same happens on exports into the, into the EU. Um, the export declaration in the UK, arrival, exit, um, the ICS pre-arrival declaration, um, arrive at customs, inspections, temporary storage, etc. So whenever we look at this, and there is sometimes a tendency, particularly in the UK, to just look at it as what happens on, on, on the, the right-hand side of that, that circle, but the same has to happen, and any, any future trade arrangement has to take into consideration the processes on, on both sides of, of the border. So the, the future arrangements, um, a lot is talked about, uh, particularly in the UK, or the UK staying in the customs union, but, but to me the real, the real question is just staying in the customs territory. It's only when a country is in the EU customs territory that there are no customs formalities. There are countries with customs union uh, arrangements with the EU. Uh, Norway is often mentioned as being the EEA model. Can the UK stay in, uh, or join the EEA? Um, Turkey... Uh, They've both got customs union, Switzerland customs union with the EU, but both, all of those have customs formalities at the border.
they all need an import declaration or, or have to use transit to, to cross the border. But it's only if the UK stayed in the customs territory would there be no customs formalities at all. Outside of the customs territory, there is the potential to have the e be in the EU security zone. So again, that would hopefully, if that's possible, remove the need for the, the pre-arrival safety and security declarations. Um, but ultimately, if there's no deal, then we'll be just treated like a third country goods. So the same as exported from the Netherlands to the US will be the same process to export from the Netherlands to the UK. Another uh, consideration that a lot of is focused on customs, but there's also the, the VAT arrangements as well. So um, you have got a situation in, in Europe where we've got countries that are in the customs union, they're in the customs territory, sorry, um, such as the Channel Islands, but they actually sit outside the VAT territory. So although they're in the customs territory, there are still customs declarations inbound into the, into the United Kingdom for VAT purposes. Now, the, the UK government has recognised that currently uh, UK businesses um, benefit from a simplification in VAT reporting, the interest act, um, and so no VAT is collected at the point of import. So there's no postponed accounting in the UK at the moment. Um, there is postponed accounting in a, in a number of EU, other EU member states where VAT is not collected at import. It's deferred uh, onto the, the VAT accounting arrangements. But if uh, the UK doesn't stay in the VAT territory, uh, what are they going to do with the VAT import? Now, they've, they've said they're aware of this problem. Um, I mean, if we look at that 240 billion value, you know, are we talking you know, maximum 48 billion pounds worth of VAT, uh, additional burden on, on business cash flow? So the, the government has, has said in their, in their budget um, and in all their, their papers that they're, they're aware of this, this challenge, this problem, uh, but as ever, they've not come up with, with any solutions. So there is a, you know, is a concern there. Um, will companies look to, to set up uh, VAT registrations in, in other territories? Uh, will they need some kind of fiscal representation? Um, you know, do we see an increase in that? Yeah, possibly. So of the, the two options by customs, um, the, the political favourite is the, is the EU partnership, which will involve uh, paying uh, duty at the higher rate, um, so running two tariffs in effect. Um, whilst this is politically uh, the, the preferred option because it avoids the need of a, of a border, um, from a practical point of view, obviously there's a lot of challenges, not least from the European side, the, the legal uh, process um, to allow uh, a non-EU member state to collect taxes on behalf of the EU. And also will France, Netherlands, Germany, Belgium be willing to collect UK duties on behalf of the UK for goods that might be imported there for onward movement to the UK. So practically most most people think that the partnership is not possible. The alternative is the high, highly streamlined arrangement or which is now being called Max FAC by, by, by some, um, maximum facilitation. From a political point of view, this isn't, isn't particularly light because it does still have a border. It doesn't matter how, how soft that border might be. Um, there is still a border that's crossed. Um, but from a practical point of view, uh, it's built on a lot of uh, what is already there. So the legal framework for this uh, exists. You know, it, it's just uh, allowing for the simplifications. Um, OK, there's, there's potentially more that could be done with technology or sharing data. But in principle, this process exists where the partnership is, is completely new, doesn't exist at all. So we can see you know, the sort of things that are looking at. You can have, uh, you have your export declarations. Um, you, really, the middle bit is, is where the, the simplifications are coming. You know, do we have a, a mandatory pre-arrival process? Does that pre-arrival uh, declaration come from the export declaration? Do people just do one declaration and that data is shared? Um, I mean, the UK often points to the, the Norwegian, uh, Norway, Sweden uh, situation, but even there, although there's a very slick process, um, a trader still does two declarations. They do a Norwegian export declaration and they do a Swedish import declaration. And although they, they present these both to just one customs point, uh, the customs officer, being he Norwegian or Swedish, has to uh, process two declarations. 
So, yeah, is there is there an opportunity to just have one declaration? Possibly, but not within uh, not by uh, March next year anyway, um, and within any transition period, it's difficult to see. So, you you start with an export declaration. Potentially, transit could be used. The benefit of using transit, uh, if the UK can stay in the uh, transit convention or join the transit convention as it leaves the uh, leaves the EU, is that uh, they could start. A, you could start a movement uh, inland, um, and then finish the, the movement inland in the other in the other territory. So, at least simplify or minimise uh, the time spent at the border. Um, with all the customs formalities being handled away from the border crossing. Um, AEO is, is touted as being uh, a prime requirement for operating any kind of these simplified procedures. Uh, and we've seen an increase. Uh, strangely enough, the, the largest number of AEO applications um, over the last couple of years has been in the UK. That's probably for two reasons. One, uh, Brexit, people seeing that there might be some benefits in having AO, um, but also the UCC introducing guarantees and, and the AO status having the guarantee waiver facilities. Um, but even so, the number of AOs currently is a small fraction of, of the total number of traders and nowhere near uh, the number required to make a, any significant dent on normal import and export procedures. So obviously the volume of declarations is, is significant increase and becomes even more significant in terms of uh, e-commerce. And it's questionable whether whether the, the volumes, the 55 million to 200 million and, 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 and the numbers in other member states have taken e-commerce fully into account. A lot of these are, are small packages uh, moved by postal operators or parcel carriers. And as can be seen, in, uh, you know, we're, there's been surveys that estimate a 14% growth in e-commerce business um, over the next year or so. So you know, what we have now is only going to grow even, even more. If we uh, look at some figures, there's, there's you know, hundreds of thousands of parcels going to and from Europe uh, every day. Um, if we think that each one of those packages might need a customs declaration, uh, you soon exceed the projected figures by by customs. Um, if you if you look at the again at the, at the figures, um, the, the, uh, there was a UPS survey um, that, that was run recently, and it showed that seventy three percent of of people shopping online uh, have made a purchase from a retailer within Europe. So uh, currently, all those goods would be moving without customs declarations. Uh, Post-Brexit, uh, a proportion of those will obviously need customs declarations. Um, interestingly enough, 57% of uh, European shoppers already order something from retailers outside the continent. So there's a huge amount of e-commerce already being imported into the EU. Um, there's some countries that, that are much uh, more active in that market, the UK being one, but also uh, Germany, Sweden, um, France to a certain extent. Um, there's other countries that, that maybe don't have such a large international e-commerce market yet, but it's, it's growing everywhere. A major challenge that a lot of uh, e-commerce people delivering e-commerce goods, uh, the postal operators and the parcel carriers find, is the is the non-delivery. They, they attempt to make a delivery, uh, they can't deliver it, uh, they can't collect the taxes, or maybe the package is, is refused. Um, and then the challenge of either you know, recovering the taxes or re-exporting those goods. Now, the actual process from that will vary from country to country. Sometimes that might be a, uh, uh, an actual reclaim position. So the, 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 the carrier has to go to the, the customs authority and ask for the money back. There may be a post-import, electronic post-import adjustment process um, that's done. Um, or it could be a manual recovery position. Um, but if we add in, that's already a challenge for those goods coming in from outside the EU. If we add in the, the Brexit volumes, um, that just adds to the, to the burden on businesses to try and recover those taxes for, for refused deliveries. Another challenge for, for European e-commerce traders will be that um, 
72% of buyers apparently, when they're looking at uh, whether to buy goods from a from a, an e-commerce trader, will be looking at the cost of the the shipping, uh, the delivery, um, and also the taxes and fees. But for those e-commerce traders that are operating just within the EU, um, that's that's you know, not not a major issue. Uh, you know they can get their rates, they know the shipping costs. Um, the, the taxes don't really factor, um, apart from VAT, which is fixed regardless of, of, of the products they're, they're, they're shipping. Um, there may be some zero rated or reduced rate items, but generally it's a, it's a much simpler calculation. If we throw customs duties into the equation, then that, that challenge becomes much greater. So for an e-tailer to know exactly what the duties might be, especially as the tariffs diverge from the UK and the EU, um, could be a real challenge. Um, and how are they going to calculate those, those costs? It was interesting. Uh, I, I've not heard of it, heard of the, heard of the phrase. Um, some of you may already know, but it was a new one to me that I was listening to uh, in these committee meetings over the last last two days. So you know, we all know just in time, but uh, with e-commerce, the, the just when I need it uh, shipments. So uh, I'm sure that will become a, a common phrase as as we go go forward. For the customs authorities, one of their one of their biggest challenges um, is is back to VAT again. Um, the, particularly with the international shipments coming in, um, the, 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 the disruption has really been felt on, on the high street, um, not only because of the convenience, people stay at home, obviously order online or on their mobile phone, um, but potentially they're getting the goods cheaper because of the, the VAT reliefs that can be applied to low value goods. Um, whether legitimately or, or not low value. Um, but it was found, uh, for example, in, in the UK with trade with the Channel Islands, that companies were exporting goods in bulk to the Channel Islands um, and therefore rec recovering the VAT, um, zero rate in the VAT. Um, those goods were being broken down into small packages, uh, being sold on the e-commerce platforms and shipped back to the UK. And the, the importer, the private uh, individual, uh, didn't pay any, any import VAT. So that was causing a huge disruption both to, to the high street but also to the, the tax revenues. So uh, the, you know, with the trend of more and more e-commerce, um, that's something that, that the EU and, and other countries have, have already been, been looking at. Um, under the Brexit white papers, the UK has already said that uh, they don't see they will extend the VAT relief to small low value goods from the EU because of the, the potential Channel Island scenario. Um, we've already seen Sweden uh, has uh, introduced a, or, or removed a de minimis limit for VAT. Um, and that doesn't only mean that they have to pay VAT at import now, but there's also the charges associated with making those customs declarations. Um, so hey, Martin, Sweden, Martin? Yeah. Martin, sorry, can you remind us yeah. the amount of minimis in general, just as a... Indication. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so in in, in the in the EU at the moment uh, for VAT, um, if the goods are under 22 euros, um, then then no VAT is collected. Um, there's higher de minimises for for customs duty, um, and generally those de minimises have been introduced uh, because of the balance between the the cost of administration, uh, cost of collecting, um, and the actual tax being collected. Um, so that's why the the, the limits have, have been set. Um, but, but with Sweden, uh, the VAT is, I think, 25% um, on the value of the goods. But the real impact on, on the importers is that uh, you know, post-Nord, uh, for example, the, the clearance fee could be anywhere between 75 and 125 krona. So, you know, sort of 12, 12 um, sorry, 7 to 12 euros. Um, Add on to that the, the amount of extra staff required at Post Nord. Uh, I think it was publicised that they had to employ around 280 people um, just to cope with the additional numbers of declarations. We're seeing, uh, I've seen similar um, introductions in other countries. Australia, for example, I believe is introducing a new system from uh, the start of July. Uh, they had a slightly higher uh, de minimis. Um, but there, what's interesting is the um, same thing. They're looking to uh, charge 
GST, uh, sales tax, on all imports of low-value goods. But there, they're given a number of options. So the supplier, the overseas supplier of the goods, can, can register for a simplified procedure for accounting for VAT. Um, or the VAT liability might actually sit with the what they call the electronic distribution platform. So I would say that's the, the kind of the, the Amazon, eBay, uh, the re reseller uh, platform. Um, or even the re-deliverer. In, in, in Australia. So if they consider that the person who's imported it and is delivering to the, the final customer to be considered the supplier, that person uh, could become liable for the VAT, uh, the GST, sorry, um, and have to make arrangements to, to pay that to Australian customs. Uh, similarly, uh, New Zealand is looking to follow uh, the same sort of model. They, they've got proposals um, out. Um, and we're seeing that in the EU as well. So the EU is suggesting that they're going to use, uh, you see there, a one-stop one shop. Um, there's already a, a one-stop shop for, uh, a mini one-stop shop, they call it, for electronic services. Um, so, for example, Netflix um, or Audible, any kind of electronic goods or services. Um, there's already a process there where an overseas company can register for VAT and account for VAT through this one-stop shop. And they're looking to extend that now to uh, imports uh, from 2021. So overseas suppliers will be obliged to, to register for VAT um, and account for VAT uh, on a regular basis through this OSS, this one-stop one shop. Of course, the challenge will be is knowing whether those imports are coming from sellers that are registered on the one-stop shop. So at the time of import, um, you're presented with a parcel or goods. Uh, do you make a customs declaration? Don't you make a customs declaration if, if you're a broker or a carrier? Um, that could be a real challenge. How do you segregate between, between the two? Uh, the UK has also looked at ways they can maybe link in with the payment. Uh, agencies. So can the payment agencies in some way uh, monitor this? So if I'm a, in the UK and I pay on a, on a credit card uh, to an online seller, um, can the credit card check this one-stop shop list that the, the company is actually registered on there and they know the VAT will be properly accounted for? Um, if, if they're not on this list, uh, could perhaps the payment companies withhold uh, the VAT element, so deduct it uh, from what they actually pay over or transfer over to the to the seller. So again, this, these are the whole the challenges. But this is growth that's grown all the time, as you can see there. Um, the, the the proportion of uh, national sellers on on e-commerce has dropped, um, whilst the sellers from from either other EU countries or from outside the EU has has grown dramatically. As well as VAT, um, the border agencies in particular are, are looking at other risks. Um, obviously, you've got things like uh, drugs, excise goods, alcohol, counterfeit goods, money laundering, uh, all kinds of, of risks uh, associated with, with small parcels. Uh, I don't think that's ever going to go away. The, the, the nature of the small parcel traffic um, means that it's uh, ideal, fast. Guaranteed delivery, um, potentially uh, anonymous, uh, depending on how you present the goods or, or pay for the goods. So it's always been an attractive way of, of shipping illicit goods. So uh, a prime target for the uh, the border agencies. Um, Customs Border uh, CBP in the in the US have, have published a strategy on on e-commerce. Um, and it's really finding a balance between how they address these risks, um, the illicit goods, but still facilitate legitimate trade. Um, and that's always, uh, that's always going to be a challenge. The, the WCO, the World Customs Organization, um, has made you know, some significant process in this. They've, they've issued a resolution to try and balance the facilitation of e-commerce traffic. Uh, with the necessary needs to try and protect society um, and protect national interests. Um, in, uh, in, the, in the EU, you have the Import Control System, ICS. That's looking to be extended to postal traffic. Um, and the Universal Postal Union has actually uh, been working to try and 
uh, streamline uh, the process um, with a pre-advice, uh, information electronic pre-advice and pre-clearance linked to the, the C22 process. If you, if you know when you go to postal office, you attach a, a C22 to the package. Um, they're, making, they're looking at making that electronic and using that as some way of, of sharing information which can then be used by the customs authorities to do some pre-clearance analysis in theory to streamline the, the goods coming through. Um, and obviously te new technologies like artificial intelligence, big data analysis will hopefully help the customs authorities um, manage that. So finally, um, we're still dealing with the Union Customs Code, although it uh, came in uh, on the 1st of May 2016. Um, there was supposed to be a transitional arrangement until the 31st of December 2020. Uh, there's now a proposal um, and, and almost acceptance that that transitional arrangement will extend to 2025. Um, I understand politically that the December 2020 date was chosen because it fitted in with the EU's uh, financial uh, cycle. Um, but it was pretty much known to, to most of the people that knew how these systems had to be developed that they couldn't do it all in time. Um, so this isn't delaying projects that are ongoing. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be uh, delayed until 2025. Um, it's only really looking at those systems that are uh, not yet started or rely on other national system developments, um, such as uh, the Import Control System 2, uh, the NCTS in, uh, changes, future NCTS changes, uh, automated export system. So those uh, are likely going to be uh, postponed um, to 20, after 2020. Um, there's also new systems um, which, which have not started yet um, and, and need, still need to be uh, worked upon. Uh, centralised clearance for imports, uh, proof of union status um, and guarantee management. Um, so those, those are the systems that are likely to, to be postponed, but any systems that are ongoing uh, to meet UCC legislation changes they still should be aiming to be completed by, by 2020 or, or shortly afterwards. Um, there is actually uh, on the European Commission website, they do keep a, a tracking spreadsheet uh, that all uh, member states should complete uh, as to what their plans are for releasing technical specifications, when test systems would be up and running, um, and when they plan to implement across the various uh, UCC uh, projects. Interestingly enough, the only country that's actually uh, aiming to uh, meet all those is uh, the UK, uh, and we're leaving. So <laughs> that's quite a, a, str a strange one. So just briefly, just some of those, because uh, I know we're, co we're coming, to a, coming to a close now, I need to give some time for if you've got any questions. Um, just highlighting some of those changes before 2020. So uh, in, in Finland, we've got an electronic warehouse declaration. Uh, we've got temporary storage in, in Sweden. In fact, temporary storage in a, in a number of countries um, is, is becoming digital. Um, we've got CDS in the UK, um, and then we've got potentially AGS4 in the Netherlands, replacing their, their paper simplified declarations, supplementary declarations, um, and e-globalization in Belgium. So a real challenge for, for companies that are operating in, in, in many territories. Um, that was shown in the electronic transit declaration recently, uh, which has just, just been introduced to replace the level two transit simplifications for air and, and short sea. Um, it was introduced, but really none of the member states were ready, uh, none of the traders were ready, meaning that there's a, a situation where different countries are having uh, different fallback procedures, um, which for airlines who operate in naturally more than one territory is, is proving a real challenge. So uh, yeah, I'll close it there. Just a, a real summary. I think hopefully I've given you a flavour of all the challenges uh, that will probably keep us all busy in the next, uh, I, would, I would like to say five years, but I, I think it's more likely to be a decade. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I think it's going to be a Thanks. challenge for all of us and, and the customs authorities.